In 1978, five friends with a shared love of basketball set out to a nearby town to watch a game involving one of their favorite teams. What was supposed to be an enjoyable occasion, however, turned to horror when, for reasons unknown, they wound up on a steep mountain road where their car became stuck. The group of men then abandoned the vehicle. In the subsequent months, four of the five men were discovered dead, their bodies in various locations across the area. The mystery of what happened to the Yuba County Five continues to perplex authorities and online sleuths even four decades later. Gary Mathias first showed signs of mental illness when he was still in high school, and was even hospitalized around the age of 16. After leaving school, he enlisted in the US Army, but consistently abused drugs during his years in service. He was eventually diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and given a psychiatric discharge from the military. Back in his home state of California, though, Gary didn't improve. Instead of seeking treatment, he continued to self-medicate with illegal substances and was arrested and jailed on several occasions for carrying out violent attacks on men and women. He escaped from a mental hospital in 1974, wearing pajamas, and hitchhiked about 100 miles back to his home. In a separate incident where he escaped hospital, he walked 540 miles from Portland, Oregon to Marysville, California. Eventually, Gary sought proper treatment and began taking medication for his schizophrenia. His behavior saw a marked improvement, and by 1978, he was considered by his doctors to be, quote, one of our sterling success cases. He was able to hold down a job at his stepfather's gardening business, which supplemented his disability pay from the army, and for the two years leading up to his disappearance, his behavior, by all accounts, had been excellent. In the months before he went missing, Gary became friends with four other men. The group were affectionately referred to by family members as The Boys, with each of them living with their parents in Yuba City and Marysville, California. Theodore Ted Wire was the oldest of the group at age 32. He was described as a slow learner and was known to be friendly and trusting in the same way as a child. It was noted that he would wave to strangers and become upset if they did not wave back. Ted had spent some time working as a janitor and a snack bar clerk, but eventually quit at the persuasion of his family, who believed his slowness was causing issues. Jack Madruga, aged 30, was the second oldest of the group. A high school graduate and an army veteran, he too was informally labeled as a slow learner. He had recently been let go from his job as a busboy. 29-year-old William Bill Sterling and 24-year-old Jackie Hewitt were both described as having learning disabilities. Jackie was closest to Ted, noted as being a shadow to his friend, and he was known to hate making phone calls. Ted would often answer or make calls on his behalf. Meanwhile, Bill was reportedly deeply religious and spent hours reading at the library. The group's favorite thing to do together was watch or play sports. They were particularly fond of basketball, which they played together on a team called the Gateway Gators. The team was supported by a local program for those with intellectual disabilities, and the day after the men disappeared, the Gateway Gators were due to participate in a week-long tournament sponsored by the Special Olympics. The winners of the tournament would get a free holiday in LA, and the group were very excited about the event and had been meticulously planning and preparing for it in the weeks before. On the evening of February 24th, 1978, a day before the tournament began, the group thought it would be fun to watch a basketball game at the California State University as a team they liked were playing. All five men piled into Jack's turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego, 
Only he and Gary had driving licenses, but Jack was very particular about his car, which was his pride and joy, and refused to let anyone else drive it. Just before 10 p.m., the men got back into the car after the basketball game ended. Before making the journey home, they decided to stop at Bear's Market in downtown Chico. The woman working the till that night remembered the group because they came in just as she was about to begin closing up, much to her irritation. The men bought various snacks, two Pepsis and some milk before leaving and getting back into their car. They drove south of Chico and were never seen again. The following morning, their families reported them missing. Though the police in Yuba County began searching for any sign of them in and around Chico, they were unable to locate the five men or their vehicles. It wasn't until February 28th that the first clue in the case was found, when a forest ranger spotted the Mercury Montego parked along Oroville Quincy Road. He had initially seen the car on the 25th, but was unaware that it was connected to five missing people until he saw a bulletin pertaining to the case. At this point, he made investigators aware of his findings. Inside the car, police found nothing particularly useful. There were wrappers and empty cans and cartons from the items the men had purchased from Bear's Market, programs from the game they'd attended, and a copy of several maps, including one of California. One of the most peculiar things detectives noted, though, was the vehicle's location. It was 70 miles from Chico, and nowhere near any route available at the time that would take them to Marysville or Yuba City. Furthermore, the track that it was on was described as a long, winding, mountainous dirt road, and nobody, including the men's family, could understand why they'd climbed such a road, especially given that they were not prepared for the harsh winter weather. Each man had gone out in a light jacket. They'd made no mention of stopping by anywhere else after the game, and it was unlike them to do so, given that they had plans to attend their basketball tournament the following day. Jack Madruga's parents noted that their son was not fond of cold weather and had never gone up into the mountains. Similarly, Bill's father pointed out that his son was not interested in the outdoors. He'd once taken him on a fishing trip, but he did not seem to enjoy it. The car was around 4,400 feet in elevation, around where the snow line was at that time of year. The remainder of the road was closed for the winter. While the car had gotten stuck in snow drifts, and there was evidence that the men had attempted to spin the wheels to get it out, investigators believed that the snow wasn't so deep that the five men couldn't have pushed it free. They also noted that the keys were missing, and initially suspected that the vehicle had, in some way, failed. But after hot-wiring the Montego, they discovered that the car was running perfectly, and there was still fuel left in the tank. This led to a lot of confusion about why the men had abandoned their vehicle. By all accounts, there was no reason they couldn't have freed the car and returned to the road. A further look at the vehicle, once it had been towed back to the station, revealed that the undercarriage had no dents, gouges, or mud scrapes, despite having been driven a considerable distance up a bumpy, mountainous dirt road. It is described as a low, heavy car, which would have been even weightier with five adult men inside. Investigators theorized that the car had been driven very carefully or by someone familiar with the road. However, Jack's parents noted that he would not be familiar with the terrain, and as mentioned earlier, he did not let others drive his car. One other oddity about the vehicle is that it had been left unlocked and with a window rolled down. Jack's loved ones stated that it was unlike him to leave the car in such an unsecured state. Further search efforts after this point were abandoned due to the worsening weather. Though no more evidence was collected at this time, the police were inundated with reported sightings of the men in various parts of the state and beyond. Some alleged sightings put them in Ontario, Canada, and others in Tampa, Florida. There was even a supposed sighting of them in a Sacramento cinema in the company of an older man. None of these sightings were ever proven at the time. Police even spoke with psychics at this point, who claimed they'd been kidnapped and taken to Arizona or Nevada, while another alleged that they'd been murdered in Oroville in a two-story red brick house, or possibly a red-stained wood house with a gravel driveway and the number 4723 or 4753. 
One investigator on the case, Yuba County Lieutenant Lance Ayers, even drove around looking for the house for two days, but was unable to find it. One witness who is deemed credible by investigators is Joseph Shams, who was 55 at the time of the disappearance. He told authorities that on the night of February 24th, he had been in the vicinity of where the Montego had been abandoned. According to Joseph, he had a cabin and had driven up intending to check in on the property. At 5.30 p.m. and about 150 feet up the road, however, his vehicle became stuck. In the process of trying to free it, he realized he was experiencing the early symptoms of a heart attack. He returned to his car and kept the engine running to provide heat. Six hours passed before Joseph saw headlights behind him. At this point, he was lying in his car and experiencing severe pain. The car behind him had a group of people around it, one of whom was a woman with a baby. He recalled shouting to them for help, but they ignored him, turning their headlights off and going quiet. Joseph later saw two more lights behind him, this time flashlights, and called out again. But once more, he was ignored, and the lights were turned off, giving way to darkness. A short time later, Joseph recalled that a pickup truck parked behind him for a brief time before continuing down the road. However, he told investigators that he couldn't be completely sure of this sighting because at that time he was delirious from the pain he was suffering. By morning, his car had run out of fuel and his symptoms had dulled down somewhat. He decided then to walk eight miles down the road to a lodge where he was driven back home. He passed by the Montego left behind by the Yuba County Five. He remembered hearing voices coming from this direction during the night. It has been confirmed that Joseph suffered a mild heart attack on the night of the 24th. If Joseph was correct when he said he heard voices and saw flashlights in the direction of the Montego, it is possible these voices and flashlights belonged to the missing men. However, Ted's mother noted that ignoring someone who was asking for help was not something her son would likely do. He and Bill once helped someone they knew get to hospital after overdosing on Valium, Ted wasn't afraid to aid someone in need. One other witness who had been deemed credible by investigators is a woman who worked at a store in Brownsville, a small town 30 miles from where the Montego was later found. On March 3rd, a week after the five men went missing, the witness saw flyers pertaining to the case. She recognized the photographs of the men included and told detectives that four of the five had stopped at the store the day after they went missing. Notably, they'd been inside a red pickup truck. A secondary witness, the store owner, corroborated this account. The witness identified Bill and Jackie as being in a telephone booth just outside the store. This is particularly interesting, as Jackie was known to have an aversion to making and taking phone calls. The store owner, meanwhile, said that Jackie was actually one of the men who entered the store alongside Ted. The pair purchased burritos, chocolate milk, and soft drinks. While those who knew the men considered that their purchases lined up with the kind of products they were known to buy, Ted's brother told the LA Times that it was completely out of character for him to be driving around Brownsville in an unidentified vehicle, especially when they were due at a basketball game they'd all been very much looking forward to. Months after the disappearances, on June 4th, a break in the bizarre case finally came. A group of passing motorcyclists decided to stop at a campsite about 19 miles from where the Montego had been located. At the campsite, there was a trailer maintained by the US Forest Service. The front window had been broken, and when the group opened the door, they were met with a foul stench which emanated from inside. The smell turned out to be that of a decaying corpse. It was the body of Ted Weiher. Eight sheets had been wrapped around him, including his head, and his feet were badly frostbitten, almost gangrenous. His autopsy revealed that he'd died from a combination of starvation and hypothermia, and that he'd lost almost half of his 200-pound weight. The growth of his beard indicated that he'd lived for around 13 weeks from when he'd last shaved. Some of his personal possessions remained inside the trailer, a wallet with cash, a nickel ring with Ted engraved on it, and a gold necklace. One thing investigators found that his family could not identify was a gold watch. His family did not believe that it belonged to him, and the families of the other men could not identify it either. Additionally, 
Ted's shoes were nowhere to be found. Searchers soon discovered further bodies, those of Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling. They were on the opposite side of the road, about 11 miles from the Montego. Scavenging animals had fed off Jack's corpse, while the bones of Bill had been scattered across a small area. It was determined that both had died of hypothermia, and investigators had speculated that one of the men may have succumbed to sleep, one of the last stages of hypothermia, and the other stayed with him before finally passing away in the same manner. In the days that followed, Jackie's father found his son's backbone under a bush, just two miles from the trailer. His shoes and jeans were located nearby and helped to identify the remains. His skull was discovered a further day later, 300 feet from the bush. Dental records confirmed that the remains were, indeed, those of the 24-year-old. His cause of death was established as hypothermia. About 400 meters from the trailer, searchers found the forest service blankets and a rusted torch by the road, but it is unclear how long those items were there. Though authorities distributed Gary's image to mental institutions in California, as it was likely that he didn't have his medication, he has never been located. Investigators found Ted's demise to be particularly troublesome, given that the trailer contained food, matches, tinder, and even heavy forestry clothing, which would have helped the men keep warm. They discovered that about a dozen sea ration cans from a nearby storage shed had been opened and the contents eaten, but a locker in that same shed hadn't been accessed. It contained enough food for all five men to sustain themselves for a year. Similarly, a butane tank that could have been used to continue heating the trailer had been left untouched. It seems, though, that Ted's actions aren't that bizarre given his known behaviors. His family stated that he lacked common sense due to his disability, noting that he often asked why he should stop at a stop sign and once spent over $100 on pencils that he had no use for. One night, when the family's house caught fire, he even had to be dragged out of bed after telling his family to leave him alone because he needed to rest for work the following day. Authorities also concluded that it was likely Ted hadn't been alone in the trailer, speculating that both Gary and Jackie had been in there with him at some point. Gary's trainers had been left behind, causing some speculation that he'd taken Ted's shoes because his own no longer fit due to his feet swelling from frostbite. Furthermore, the C rations had been opened with a P38 can opener, and only Gary or Jack Madruga would have been familiar with this device given that they both served time in the military. It has also been noted that the sheets over Ted's body had likely been wrapped around him by somebody else, as his feet would have caused far too much pain for him to maneuver the fabric around himself. To this day, investigators still can't fully explain what happened to the Yuba County Five. It is still unclear as to how the men ended up on the dirt road, although there is speculation that they became lost. It has also been theorized that most of the men failed to feed themselves or clothe themselves with forestry clothing because they were afraid they would be accused of stealing. It is possible that they didn't start a fire inside the trailer because they had been told in the past not to start fires, although it has also been suggested that the men thought they'd broken into a private property and did not want to touch anything for fear of being reprimanded or apprehended by police. While authorities learned that Gary had friends in Forbes Town and suggested that they got lost driving there, those friends have reportedly said he wouldn't drop by unannounced and that they had made no plans with him. The day before the men disappeared, a USFS snowcat had gone to the trailer from the road where the Montego was found to clear snow from its roof. Police have speculated that the group followed the tracks left behind, falsely believing that the trailer wasn't far away. They suggested that Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling died of hypothermia about halfway through the walk, and that the remaining three men broke the trailer window to enter. While the Charlie Project notes that the families of the other men have said it's possible that Gary was involved in the incident that led to their deaths, investigators don't believe that he was involved, nor do they believe he is alive. Online theorists have proposed that Gary left the trailer to seek help, but became lost, possibly in a heavily forested area, and his body has not been found because he is further away from the others and hidden by shrubs and foliage. 
The case of the Yuba County Five is a mystery to many, and Gary Mathias is still missing. Gary is described as a white male with brown hair and hazel eyes. He wears glasses and has a small birthmark on the right side of his chin. He is five foot 10 and weighed 170 pounds at the time of his disappearance. He was 25 when he went missing, and if he is still alive, will be 70 years old. If you have any information about Gary's disappearance, you can contact the Yuba County Sheriff's Department at 530-749-7777. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.